This morning's scripture is Genesis chapter 39, the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife. Now Joseph was taken down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man. He was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. He made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And with him there, he had no concern for anything but the food that he ate. Now Joseph was handsome and good looking. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, look, with me here, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my hand. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except yourself, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And although she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not consent to lie beside her or to be with her. One day, however, when he went into the house to do his work, and while no one else was in the house, she caught hold of his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. When she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled outside, she called out to the members of her household and said to them, see, my husband has brought among us a Hebrew to insult us. He came in to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And when he heard me raise my voice and cry out, he left his garment beside me and fled outside. Then she kept his garment by her until his master came home. And she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came in to me to insult me. But as soon as I raised my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled outside. When his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him saying, this is the way your servant treated me, he became enraged. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. He remained there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love he gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. The chief jailer committed to Joseph's care all the prisoners who were in the prison, and whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The chief jailer paid no heed to anything that was in Joseph's care, because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. Thank you, Wilson. Friends, please pray with me. Gracious God, may the words of my lips, may the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Amen. You guys have been getting long, raunchy readings in this uh, sermon series. Now, Joseph's clothes are always getting him into trouble. You know, two weeks ago, we were told about how Jacob gave Joseph a colorful robe. Some might call it an amazing technicolor dream coat. I'm going to work that into every sermon. <laughs> and it deeply offended his older brothers, as it was a symbol of Jacob's favoritism. And last week, Megan preached on how Joseph found himself in a pit and then sold to slavery by those very brothers. And to hide their deed, they took Joseph's fancy robe smeared it in goat blood, and told their father a wild animal had devoured Joseph. 
Jacob mourns the loss of his favorite son, but Joseph is alive in Egypt, now a slave to the captain of Pharaoh's guard, Potiphar. And once again, his clothes are being used against him, a prop and another lie. Now, a lot of feminist commentators criticize today's passage for promoting misogyny, and they aren't wrong. After all, Joseph and Potiphar have names. While she's nameless, her identity defined entirely by her relationship to her powerful husband. You know, at least Jezebel gets to be infamous. We can't even talk about this passage without talking about Potiphar's wife. And then there's the ugly stereotype that is at the heart of this story, which is that certain women are promiscuous, crafty, dishonest, and out to destroy righteous men. These attitudes about women get unconsciously absorbed by a society at large, which makes it that much harder for women to report their stories and be believed. Stories like this one, of the righteous man being wrongly punished, are used to protect abusers from their harassment, and women continue to suffer. Now, I have known men unfairly accused of abusing someone, and I have a friend in the ministry who was even falsely accused of sexual harassment by a girl in his youth group. This is like a minister's worst nightmare. Fortunately, the Lutheran church took the girl's accusation very seriously, investigated it, and she admitted that she had made up the story. She was a troubled teenager who got help, and my friend's career managed to continue. It doesn't always work out that neatly, but I also don't think that our society has a chronic problem with righteous men being torn down by wily women. No, even after Me Too, I think we all know that women continue to be discounted, disbelieved, and demonized when they dare tell the truth, and powerful men continue to hold power. Last time I preached on this, it was September 2018 during the Brett Kavanaugh hearings. I did not choose the scripture of my own free will. It was just the Holy Spirit doing that. But whether it's Brett Kavanaugh or Clarence Thomas enjoying their lifetime appointments on the Supreme Court, or Bill Clinton and Donald Trump, presidents who called the women who accused them liars, only to be shown that they themselves were the liars. Our nation's leadership is full of powerful men who have used society's distrust of women to avoid accountability for their actions. And sadly, whether it's America today or Egypt long ago, these things are not decided by the truth of the matter or the principle of a fair hearing or any ideal of justice. It's it's decided by power, not truth. Now, Joseph may have been innocent. He may have been a man in a time of patriarchy. But that won't protect him from being a slave and a foreigner accused by a free woman. He's a rung lower on the social ladder. And sure, if he was accused by a female slave, this would be an entirely different story. But Potiphar's wife has more power. And as I said, far too often, that is how we decide things. And here's where I think we need to talk about race. Now, race as we understand it today is an invention of colonialism. But ethnicity, prejudice, and what we now call racism is as old as humanity. Slaves in Egypt could come from any ethnicity and usually the children weren't also born into bondage. But we do see the foreshadowing here of the fate that will befall not just this particular Hebrew, but all Hebrews in the land of Egypt. By the time of Moses, the Hebrews will still be in Egypt, but living in generational slavery, enduring forced labor and even infanticide. And notice how Potiphar's wife 
uses the fact that Joseph is not only a slave, but a Hebrew, to get the household on her side. She tells them, my husband has brought among us a Hebrew to insult us. Probably our earliest recorded anti-Semitism right there. Now, one of the greatest fears of the oppressor is that the oppressed will rise up and take revenge. But an adjacent fear, especially in a sexist and hierarchical society, is that the lower man will violate the women belonging to the more powerful man, women themselves being a possession to be guarded. And violence is used to spread fear and enforce the social order and to, quote, keep people in their place. Now, this is a moral sickness that is all too familiar to America. Some of you were alive in 1955 when Emmett Tell, a boy of 14 years old, was kidnapped, tortured, and murdered after being accused of harassing a white woman. Lynching at this time was enabled by the South, especially in the courts. So despite ample evidence against the killers, they were acquitted by an all-white jury. And then once they were free of double jeopardy and being tried again, they openly admitted to the murders and even detailed how they did it to a magazine. Emmett Till is perhaps the most famous example of lynching in American history, but far from the only one or the most recent. In Alabama, there's a museum and a memorial dedicated to the victims of lynching with thousands of names spread out over 800 different counties. Too many black boys and men were publicly lynched throughout the Jim Crow South, and usually it was done after... How did Potiphar's wife put it? An insult to a white woman. Now, there are people, a lot of people, who think we talk about race too much in this country and say all of this is in the past. But Emmett Till would be 81 years old right now. And if age was good to him, he could be ushering alongside Ernie Fay and Charles Hadvani this morning. This is not the ancient past. And even if it was, even if it was every bit as ancient as Potiphar, we still have something to learn. Today's passage is about human nature. It's about the sin of prejudice and the disregard of justice. That's not yesterday's problem. That's our problem right now. We still have a long way to go, and we worship a God that demands better from us. A God that wants us to follow in the truth, to be merciful and just, to be fair and loving, not only to those that we love, but to the foreigner, to the prisoner, to the slave. Now, fortunately for us, God is slow to anger, and steadfast in love. One of the things I love about the Joseph story is that we're getting a taste of the gospel right now when we're still in the book of Genesis. The Joseph story is a story of resurrection, of forgiveness, of new beginnings. This is decidedly not the story of an angry, vengeful God. No. God doesn't flood the world or send plagues. It's not this time. God strikes down, God doesn't strike down Potiphar or his nameless wife, but instead stays with Joseph. The scripture tells us that the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love. God is not the source of Joseph's suffering. Nowhere in this text is it said that God is testing Joseph or humbling Joseph. Yes, God does have a plan for Joseph. But personally, I don't think that God sends us trials and tribulations so that he can complete some kind of mysterious divine plan. 
No, our suffering is not part of God's plan, but our healing, our healing is. Our spiritual growth and maturity that comes from adversity, that's part of God's plan. Our strength and our perseverance, those are the things that come from God. God is not with the powerful when they do injustice. Whether it's Potiphar throwing a faithful servant in prison or his wife falsely accusing him. God's presence in this story is abundantly clear. The Lord is with Joseph. And God is about to work most powerfully through the slave, through the outcast, the foreigner, the prisoner. If God can be with somebody brought so low, God can also be with you. When you don't fit in, when you are falsely accused, when you are sick, when you are grieving, when you need strength and love from above just to get through the day, God is with you. But just as important as being with you, God is with other people. Remember that. Especially the oppressed. Women who aren't believed. Prisoners unjustly accused. Foreigners mistreated because of our bigotry, racial minorities suffering the indignities of racism. May we all learn to see God in them. Because since Genesis, since the beginning, God has been working through the oppressed and the persecuted. Thanks be to the God of love and the God of freedom. And amen.